Hello friends, this is Dave Hurwitz, Executive Editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the very best and some of the very worst performances of Beethoven's Symphony No. 6, the Pastoral Symphony. Oh wow, do I love the Pastoral Symphony. Well, you know why? Because it was really the piece that got me turned on to classical music in the first place when I was a little kid. And I got to tell the story, even though I've told it before, you might as well hear it again. When I was a little tot, bouncing off my father's knee, my mother had this really good, solid record collection of classical recordings. And I was learning how to read. So that meant I was like five or six. I learned how to read when I was six, but I was sort of, you know, faking it before and trying to pronounce things. And I whipped out this record she had. It was Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony with William Steinberg and the Pittsburgh Symphony on Command Classics. I remember it like it was yesterday. And the cover of that album was The Harvest by Bruegel. You know the picture, right? Wheat fields and, and peasants sitting around making sheaves and things like that. That's what it was. And I looked at it and I said to my mother, what does this word mean, pastoral? And she said, put on the music and look at the painting. And I did. And it hit me. And the sky opened. All of a sudden, I understood that there was an entire means of nonverbal communication out there. Gorgeous nonverbal communication. I heard it. I looked at it and I understood it and I was mesmerized. And the rest, as they say, is history. That's the story in brief. So I love Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony. It's like one of my best friends musically. And it's not an easy symphony to, to pull off. It really isn't. First of all, it's quite long. It's the longest Beethoven symphony after the Eroica and, of course, the Ninth. And so it, it takes a certain amount of, of smarts to shape and structure the thing in a way that doesn't become dull because it's a very relaxed sounding piece, except for the thunderstorm. I mean, all of it sort of sounds like every other bit because most of the themes are extremely pure, diatonic, arpeggiated harmony. That is simple chords. And they go up and down on those simple chords, you know, da 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 da. Yeah, I mean, that's it's really very, very straightforward. But that means you have to work hard to keep it interesting. Not that Beethoven didn't understand that that was an issue, but interpreters often don't understand how Beethoven resolved the issue. And that is the point. And that's one of the things we're really going to talk about because I, I just love this piece so much. And I think that it really would help to put you in the right frame of mind if we do a little, little teeny tiny bit of formal analysis, not of the first movement, of the second movement, the scene by the brook, because that is a toughie. That's the movement that usually sinks a performance, a not good performance, because it's supposed to be a brook and it's always moving along steadily and it's and it's very dreamy and the themes are little themelets that repeat 4,000 billion times, do, 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 you know, over and over and over. It, it, it's, it can sound really tedious. And it can also just take too long because it's the largest movement in the symphony, hands down. If you take the first movement repeat, then the first and second movements really ought to about balance with the second movement probably being just slightly longer. But you don't have to take the first movement repeat, although I think you should because it's a good repeat. It doesn't sound stupid like the first movement of the seventh. It's a good repeat. And you should probably do it. If you do do it, then you've got that inherent balance in terms of timing, just substantively. If you don't take it, then the first movement sounds more preludial, and that throws even more weight onto the second movement and absolutely, absolutely makes it essential that you do it right. So I want to tell you about the second movement, the scene by the brook. This movement is in perfect sonata form with a big development section and an extensive coda. Now, in music, slow means big because we're moving through time, right, folks? And that's a real, real issue. It's going to be long. And sonata forms, particularly, which are supposed to be dramatic and dynamic and show motion, are 
particularly susceptible to becoming very large when you're doing things with them in slow tempos. And, you know, that's why the typical sonata form in a Mozart symphony, for example, is the famous sonata form with no development section. Because there isn't room for one. You're still going to get 10 minutes of music just dealing with a first subject and then a second subject and a complementary key and all of the themes associated with those two key areas. And then repeating them with a little embellishment, that serves you really well for a slow movement as Mozart demonstrated time and time again. But Beethoven is going to write an entire big sonata form movement in first movement sonata form. And, and the way he does it is so sophisticated, so fabulous, because not only does the music do everything sonata movements are supposed to do, it has all of the, the tension and the movement of a sonata movement, but it, it does so while expressing total stasis, complete leisure, leisureliness, relaxation, but it's really moving all along. And it's this tension between movement and tranquility or movement that expresses tranquility, if you want to call it that, that so many conductors fail to realize. And and so let's let's just get right to it. Now, I have a, a sample here. Hold it. Oh, before I do that, I just have to tell you, see, I'm whetting your appetite and then frustrating you. Hee <laughs> hee. My book, the Beethoven book, it's out. It's on Amazon. Please consider buying it. It's really a pretty good book, if I do say so myself. Okay, end of shameless plug. Now, I have here, wait a minute, I've got like dozens and dozens of recordings of this sucker, but the one that we're going to use as my exemplar for the slow movement of the Sixth Symphony is Paul Kletsky with the Czech Philharmonic, because it's the Czech Philharmonic and they sound so Czech and so Philharmonic and with fabulous woodwinds. So we're going to use this one as we go through the whole thing. And I'm just going to take you through the movement formally, very simply, because once you know what the form is, then the movement doesn't seem long at all. If you can follow the development, if you can follow the argument, all of a sudden it begins to seem very compact. It's amazing how your subjective perception of time changes once you know where you are. And this movement gave me so much aggravation when I was really trying to figure out how Beethoven put it together. It's not that simple. It's it's very sophisticated rhythmically. I mean, it's in 12-8 and it's, it's a tricky movement rhythmically. It occurs as layers of movement going at different speeds. And then again, you have these themes, which all have a family similarity. And there's a reason for it. There really is, which I'll tell you in a moment. So let us begin at the beginning. Beethoven has a principal subject. Sonata four movements, as some of you may know, have two subjects in complementary keys. A subject may contain a single theme or many themes and ideas. It doesn't matter. What matters is where you put them in terms of harmony. So this movement opens with a beautiful, relaxed subject consisting of tiny little fragments, a little melodic turn. Do, 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 do. Here it is. I'm going to play it for you. And I, I mean, let's just give it a listen. Here's the first subject. Now, I, I mean, you know the symphony, you've heard that a million times. What you may not know is that in, in normally, you know, in a first movement exposition, you get, you get a repeat of the whole exposition. 
I mean, the whole thing goes back to the beginning and gets repeated. Beethoven doesn't do that here. He doesn't do it because, oh, possibly because it's a slow movement and it might seem deathly dull, but also because a brook that's meandering along doesn't meander backwards and start meandering all over again from the beginning. That could possibly be the reason. But actually, he plays each theme twice. And that's the first thing you need to understand, that for this exposition, both the first subject and the second subject are going to be played twice, one right after the other. I mean, that is twice for the first subject, twice for the second subject, so that they're, they're quite extended. And that creates a big, huge opening paragraph. And that's sort of, once you know that and know how it works, you're going to be fine. So that was the opening theme. Now, in between the two statements of the opening theme, comes a little tiny bridge, which we only hear once. And this is what used to drive me crazy because, you know, they say, okay, you in sonata form, you have a first subject and there's a transition and then there's a second subject. And I used to say, what is that thing? What is this little thing? Here is that little, that little tiny thing. cute, charming, and it goes away immediately. You'll never hear it again, and it doesn't make any difference. All that does is introduce the repeat of the first subject. But, but, but there's another subtlety. Sonata movements contain, as I've said a lot of times, and if you're watching my Haydn Crusade, you've heard this, two kinds of music. There's themes, subjects, and then there's motion music. Music that's designed to modulate, to take us from one location to the next location. And so usually composers write independent motion music. And in a quick movement, you know, it's full of noise and bustle and you know you, you really feel that idea of moving. In a slow movement, you're not gonna feel the idea of moving forward in quite the same way. But even more, the repeat of the first subject is its own motion music. Beethoven immediately just starts changing it. It can go anywhere. It could go, do, 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 do. You know, it doesn't make any difference. And that's how he achieves the transition to the second subject. Now, the second subject can be a little bit difficult to pinpoint where it starts. And Beethoven, again, he does this deliberately. Why? Because he wants to give the sense of constant, uninterrupted, flowing movement. And so you don't, he doesn't really let you know where the divisions are. He wants to blur all of that. But this is the second subject. It begins on the flute with a tiny anticipation and then comes in in full on the bassoon. And it's beautiful. It's a little bit more, more propulsive than the first subject. And it takes on in its second part, especially when the full violin section takes it up on the repeat. It almost sounds like a waltz. It's like a wump, ba da da, wump, two, three, up, like that. It's quite wonderful. So here is the actual second subject.
And then there's one more element that you need to know about. And that is what I call the frame. Now, remember Beethoven, he calls this the scene by the brook. It's a scene. It's a scene. It's a like a painting. And paintings, pictures, as I always say, come in frames. Here, the frame is a theme. It's its own independent tune, and it occurs after the first statement of the first subject and after the last statement of the second subject. So you hear it twice. And this also this also can make you mistake what you're hearing formally because you hear this theme and it's coming back regularly and you think, well, where, where does that fit in the scheme of things? It is the frame. It frames both subjects. And, and here it is. I'm going to play it for you the way you initially hear it and then the way you hear it after the second subject. So you can hear the slight difference in how it comes out. But it's, it's quite clear that it's the same tune and Beethoven uses it as a sort of concluding gesture to say, okay, we're coming to an end of a section and now we're going to move on. So here it is. And with that, the exposition comes to a close. So you now know how the piece is going to be put together. Because once you know the exposition of a sonata movement, you basically know the movement. You have a first theme, a transition, a first theme, pardon me, that, that, that ends with the frame. And then you have a, a small little transition, then a repeat of the first subject, which is its own motion music that takes us to the second subject on the flute, then bassoon, and that's repeated twice, and then the frame again, and you hear how it ends, and the music just keeps keeps pulsating along as we get into the development section. Now, the development section is based on all the music we've heard before, basically, and all you need to know is when the recapitulation starts, because that's the other key landmark. The recapitulation begins when you hear the opening theme on the flute, not the one in the middle of development where it's played by a clarinet. No, it's when you hear it on the flute. And here is the moment in question so that you're absolutely clear on how it happens. Now, because Beethoven has already repeated all this stuff a lot already, he's not going to do the repeats in the, in the recapitulation. He doesn't repeat each subject twice. You hear them once, and they, they move along in a greatly abbreviated way, and the frame becomes the coda. You know, the one with the little bird imitations and the cuckoo and the quail and the whatever the heck it is, the nightingale, whatever the other thing is there. You know, the partridge and the pheasant and the, you know, the swans flapping around, whatever it is, it's birds. So that is the form of the slow movement. And it's really very simple once you, once you know what it is. 
but you have to know what you're listening to. And I found out the hard way, I assure you, by listening to it like a billion times till I had it completely memorized and knew where everything was and more importantly, what it did. Because once you know that, you realize just how much, how much inevitability Beethoven built into this music. And a great performance has to capture that natural flow that never ceases from beginning to end. It should never stop. You should hear through any pauses. You should just keep on listening and notice that the the quiet energy of the of the music never for a moment ceases. And it's just one of the most magnificent examples of sonata form, one of the most sophisticated things Beethoven ever did. And it's fascinating also in that it is a more complex and more and more intricate movement, quite a bit more than the first movement. It's really the main movement of the symphony. And so that's where you need to focus your attention when you're listening. And if you're bored and fall asleep, then there's something wrong with the performance, chances are, because it can be lethally dull. It really can. Timing wise, it's a movement that should never take more than, let's say, 13 minutes. You can get away with it. Some performances barely get away with it a little bit, but basically it runs between 11 and 13 minutes with 11 and a half to 12 and a half being optimal. And there is very, very little difference in performance styles between modern instrument performances and period instrument performances. They all sort of time out very similarly, quite, quite frequently. They really do. Now, the other thing you need to know about the Pastoral Symphony before we go on to the recordings is the age old issue of program versus absolute music. And I have something to say about that, as you might have expected. Beethoven said reportedly that the music represented more the expression of feelings than tone painting, than painting with sound. And this statement gave rise to a total apocalyptic conflagration in the 19th century in German music between the Wagnerians who believed that all music should be programmatic and the Brahmsians who believed that all music should be abstract and simply express emotions and not concrete things. And whether something was symphonic or not symphonic, if it was concrete or whether it was abstract or whether it was something in the middle or it was, it was insane the amount of ink that was spilled over this comment. But what nobody seems to have noticed, and I really mean that, it's like in the past you know, couple hundred years since Beethoven wrote this, very, I, I haven't seen anybody who's, who's had this point. Not that I'm terribly original, but I'm just actually just the opposite. I'm, I'm a very simple guy. And when Beethoven says it's more the expression of feelings than tone painting, I take him at his word. In fact, the Sixth Symphony has five movements, right? Three of them are the expression of feelings and two of them are tone painting. It's exactly what Beethoven said. There's more expression of feeling than there is tone painting. But what Beethoven did not say is that there is no tone painting, that tone painting is bad, that we should beware of it, that it can't be symphonic. He didn't say anything like that. All of the crap that came up from this battle was was total nonsense. It was partisanship by people, of course, trying to justify what they wanted to do anyway in terms of what Beethoven said without bothering to consider the truth of what Beethoven might have said. Because three movements, the first movement and the third movement and the last movement have titles, all the movements have titles that are all about feelings, right? There's happy feelings, you know, empfindungen on getting to the to the countryside. And then there's and then there's there's the lustig gathering, the merry gathering of peasant folk. I mean, music cannot do peasant folk, but it can do merry. And that's what Beethoven does, the merriness of the gathering. You, you don't know who's gathering. It could be it could be a, a pack of raccoons for all we know. I mean, you know, it's 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 the merry part that matters because it's dance like, it's merry. And then after the thunderstorm, which is obviously tone painting once again, we get to the hymn of thanksgiving after the storm. Thanksgiving, happiness, contentment, gratitude. Music can do that, you see? So music can do both. And the important thing to keep in mind is that the formal means, the 
technical means by which Beethoven expresses these two theoretically completely contradictory things are identical. Absolutely identical. First movement's in sonata form. Second movement isn't even more sophisticated of first movement's in sonata form and its painting. The thunderstorm, if you really want to know, most people just say, well, it's sort of an extended introduction to the finale. Well, yes, but it happens to be an extended introduction in a somewhat modified version of sonata form without development, the form of one of Beethoven's theatrical overtures. For example, quick movements in sonata form often that are theatrical overtures don't have repeats and they often don't have development sections. The biggest example of that, the most famous probably, is the Marriage of Figaro overture, which is a perfect little sonata form with no development section. Well, that's what the thunderstorm is. So, so, so Beethoven isn't writing music any differently just because the purpose for which he's writing it may change. He writes it the way he writes it. And that's something you have to keep in mind too. So yes, it is more the expression you know, feeling than painting, but they are equally valid. And so you can't shy away from the pictorial element. You shouldn't. I mean, you can't really anyway. How do you shy away from a thunderstorm? I mean, you're going to get wet. It doesn't make any difference, right? So that's the other thing to consider. And now let's talk about performances. Terrible performances, horrible, terrible, awful, sucky performances. I'm just going to mention three out of God knows who knows. First of all, the worst of the worst. I mean, among those, Pletnev. I've talked about that, I think, in another video about how this is disgusting. It's just perverse. He just monkeys and, and potchkeys around with it and speeds up and slows down and stops and goes at it in the most mindless possible way. So Pletnev sucks. Harnoncourt really sucks, which is a pity because his Beethoven cycle is otherwise pretty wonderful. It really is. But I mean, a lot of it is anyway. But he he tries to, he had this weird idea of musical rhetoric and because it's pastoral, it should all be played in this oily, legato, lazy, oh, it's so boring. And it, and it sounds so glutinous. It's, it's, it's horrible. It's like, it's like an oil slick you know, over the, over the, the Gulf of Mexico or whatever that is, you know, you just, you just see like, like, like dying ducks covered with petroleum when you listen to Harnacourt. And the other guy who really sucked at this piece was Carrion. Interesting. Not that didn't stop him from recording it five times, of course, but he, he professed not really to like it. And it's easy to understand why. This, first of all, the music itself is of a naivete, shall we say, an honest simplicity that was totally, totally foreign to his very, very stylized way of thinking and doing things, and most of the time anyway. That's number one. Number two, he hated woodwinds, as we know. I mean, everything was always the strings, the strings, the strings. But this symphony absolutely lives or falls on the woodwind playing because it's the woodwinds, which are the 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 messengers of the pastoral concept. That's how you know it's pastoral because you've got birds and you've got chirpy things and you've got the different colors of the woodwind sections. You've got to have that highlighted. You know, I mean, you just do. And that was not a Carrion thing. He kept doing it with less and less repeats, including in the scherzo, which goes around a couple of times. And you've got to do all the repeats of the scherzo. At least you really ought to. So... So those are the three that you should avoid. I mean, my top three performances to avoid. But let's talk about ones not to avoid. All right, obviously, there is Paul Kletsky with the Czech Philharmonic. Gorgeous, it's the Czech Philharmonic. Kletsky was a very smart, very appropriate, idiomatic Beethoven conductor. It's wonderful. It's simply wonderful and gorgeous and beautifully timed and fluid and natural. It's got all the things you want in a pastoral symphony on Superfun. So give it some thought. And now we'll do a couple little historical ones. Toscanini! Now Toscanini did this symphony a couple times. He did it with the BBC back in the 30s. That recording is on EMI. And of course, that's the one the British people prefer. Everyone else prefers the good one, which is this one with the NBC symphony, because it's so much better recorded, so much better sounding, and very lively and perky. It's wonderful. What's also funny about Toscanini is the way he takes like the last two chords. Usually people want it to end in an autumnal glow. Womp, womp. You know, Beethoven just marks it simple forte, and Toscanini plays it the way Beethoven wrote it. Wah, wah. It's a shock. 
if you heard other performances, it's kind of interesting. But uh, it's a very, very fine performance. It's lively, it's fresh, it's exciting, and it has movement, which this piece must have. I mean, everything Beethoven wrote has to have that, but this really has to have it. So, if it's not to sound just sort of dull and everything sounds like everything else, it's got to move. Also wonderful in the historical department is Schurecht, because he's got the Paris Conservatoire Orchestra with its completely distinctive tone colors and its tradition going back to Beethoven himself of how to play Beethoven. You really should hear this, guys. This is the one, the one that really is more authentic than anybody who plays period instruments. Vastly more authentic. So Schurecht on Warner, definitely worth considering. Again, then there is my baby, the Steinberg Pittsburgh. Now, I was worried about this one because I imprinted on it. And I'm normally not sentimental about performances that I imprint on. I really am not. And I was prepared not to like it. And I hadn't heard it. I literally hadn't heard it in a couple of decades. And I, when this came out, this box came back out on DJ, I put it on and said, oh, my my mother had great taste. I was lucky because it's a wonderful performance. It is actually closest in a way in terms of tempo and conceptions of the period instrument performances. It's swift and it's unsentimental. And the only thing that it doesn't have is a really powerful thunderstorm. Now, I do not believe that the, sun, the thunderstorm needs to be an apocalyptic event. It is not a metaphysical you know, object. It is painting in tones. It's a summer shower. That's all it is. Let's not get carried away. You know, it's not even in Fantasia, you know, with the gods going crazy and all, you know, no. But this storm still, it needs a little more punch from the timpani and whatnot. But otherwise, it is a glorious performance and it sounds marvelous. It really does. So I was very happy to remake the acquaintance of Steinberg and Pittsburgh. Speaking of non-apocalyptic storms, this is my period instrument style performance of preference. This is Thomas Dalsgaard on C-Max with the Swedish Chamber Orchestra Orebro. Yes, that's for you, bro. It's Orebro, Orebro. Anyway, this is a really, really good performance. And again, the storm is not, it, it sounds wet. I like it. It sounds like you hear the patter of raindrops. It doesn't have this sort of like explosive quality. It's not John Life's Hecla. It's not, you know, the end of the world. It sounds like a rainstorm. I like it. I like it very much. It's a beautiful performance. And what I really like about it also is that it's in perspective because it's a chamber orchestra. And, you know, Beethoven, even though we all go through how many people he had and how many people played it and what, Beethoven gives a lot of music to the bass lines. Classical style does that. There's a top and a bottom and stuff in the middle. And you've got to have really prominent bass lines. They've got to be audible. And this performance is very nicely in balance for that reason, because they're not going to use that many cellos and basses in these little tiny orchestras. But you still got to hear the music. You still got to hear what Beethoven does. You got to hear the lines that Beethoven gives them. So this is a very, very beautiful performance, stunningly recorded, and it comes with Leonora Overtures 1, 2, and 3. So on C-Max, Dalsgaard is worth considering if you can get it. Oh, let's see. So my, all the rest of these, I think, except for one, they're all in sets, you know, because everything is in a box these days. It's very hard to find things separately. So, you know, get a good set. You'll probably get a good pastoral symphony. You really will. This is, of course, Blomstedt with the Staatskapelle Dresden. Now, this is the Berlin Classics reissue, but it's also available on Brilliant Classics for like nothing. Virtually no money. It's the same performances. Some people have talked about remastered, this remastered, that. Yeah, who cares? Makes no difference. Very, very beautiful because, again, great orchestra. You know, the Pastoral is one of those symphonies that really shows you how the orchestra plays. And where different orchestras and different concepts of sonority can make a huge difference in how you perceive the performance. That's why the Czech Philharmonic is so wonderful. And that's why the Staatskapelle Dresden is so wonderful in this music. So that's a great one. Also in period instrument style, naturally, Macaris. You got to talk about Macaris. And this is with the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic. I like this one better than his Scottish Chamber Orchestra plus Philharmonia cycle on Hyperion, although they're both excellent. 
they are really both excellent but those are live and 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 i just think i just like to hear a bigger ensemble it's that simple i just prefer this the sonority of the larger ensemble they play very very well for him and you know this was the emi eminence recording which you may or may not find anymore but it's, it's lovely it's just wonderful and it's macaris it sounds like it was written yesterday it has that kind of freshness and spontaneity that the music Demands, absolutely demands. Another great one, Dorati with the London Symphony. This Mercury Living Presence disc is a knockout. It's a knockout particularly for the transparency of texture. Top to bottom, it's fabulous. Also very swift tempos, which I like most of the time. And, you know, of course, this is Beethoven 5. Aha, and then a little print Beethoven 6. Here it is, little teeny Beethoven 6. 6 is fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. Don't think you only get this for the fifth. Get it for the sixth. Get it for the pastoral. It's even better. So there. That's a great one. And then we come to some classics. We're coming down to the last four. I had three horrible ones and 12 really good ones, which I think is a good balance, don't you? Good sense of proportion. Clemps. The Clemp. Now, Klemper's sixth was controversial because he had a very slow scherzo. Famously, Walter Legg, you know, told him it was too slow, and Clemper said to him, you'll get used to it. And then, of course, he conducted it. Then he put a stick down and he yelled at Legg, hey, you used to it yet? Hmm? That's Klemperer. But Klemperer has two great things going for him in this performance, even though it's leisurely. He's not that slow in the slow movement, because Klemperer almost never was. He's not sentimental. It's about 13 and a bit minutes. It's on the slower side, but he doesn't go nuts on it, number one, and it's all in proportion because the other tempos are leisurely. So so if you're going to be leisurely in the quick movements, you can afford to be, you know, just normal in the slow movement, and it's going to sound faster. So it all just works out beautifully. And the other thing Klemper has going for him is that he loved woodwinds. He was the anti-carrion. The woodwind balances are always very forward. You always hear them. It's like a whole little population of, of forest critters bumping around and chattering and chirping. It's, oh, it's just wonderful. It sounds very pastoral. Get it? Pastoral. That's the whole point of this damn symphony. It's really pastoral. So this is great. And then we come to the top three. And I got to tell you, I can't choose between them. I cannot. I, I just, I just vacillate, you know, on any, on any given day. I can take any of them. First, Zell. Of of course it has to be Zell, right? I mean, Zell's, Zell's known in Beethoven really for his heroica, for the more heroic side, but there has never been a more beautifully played, perfectly paced, gloriously balanced. I mean, it's just perfect and it has no stiffness. There's no, not a, not a mechanical note in it. It's just everybody doing their very, very best. The members of the Cleveland Orchestra used to tell stories about like the greatest performance they ever gave. It was at Beethoven Six while they were on tour in Switzerland. You know, there were just days when it went right. This was one of those days too. I, I, I'm telling you, this is one of the great pastoral symphonies. And most people don't pay any attention to Zell in this music because he was supposed to be such a, you know, such a, such a maniac. And you don't think maniacs can do good pastoral symphonies, but he was a wonderfully idiomatic maniac. And it's a beautiful, beautiful performance that never, for the moment, sounds maniacal. Next, ah, Bruno Walter. Yes, there's no exposition repeat in the first movement. And he did it twice. There's the mono one with Philadelphia, which is fabulous. Some people think it's a little better than this, this late one with Columbia. It's a little faster. And then there's this one with the Columbia Symphony. There are so many effortlessly beautiful nuances in this performance. I mean, it's enough to make you cry. It really is. It's perfectly done. And my God, did he know how to do that slow movement? It's just wonderful. It's a piece he clearly loved, clearly understood, had no problem projecting, even in old age. There's no way you could say that he was old or tired or this performance is in any way soft-edged or sluggish. Not, not a bit. It just teems with character and, and with the necessary energy, the necessary feeling of pulse all the way through it. It's just glorious. So Bruno Walter, either the mono one with Philly or this stereo one with the Columbia Symphony, you can't go wrong either way. 
However, this week, my favorite in this pile. I mean, you know, I, I alternate in all these piles. You can switch around. My favorite is Monte and Vienna. And I have a couple of reasons for this. This is on Decca. First of all, I really think you need to hear the Vienna Philharmonic play this music because it's it's one of their their calling card pieces for their characteristic Viennese sound, which is, of course, glorious. That's one point. The other point is, usually with the Vienna Philharmonic, the performance everyone talks about is Carl Böhm, which is gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous, but it has a slow movement that's a little longer than 14 minutes. It's one of the slowest out there, and there are times when I feel it's just a little bit too slow. It just drags a bit. And I, there, it, dep it depends on my mood. But when you're listening to a bunch of them, it's very interesting, actually, as a, as, a, as a psychological phenomenon. If you're just listening to one pastoral symphony and you haven't heard it for a while and you just pull out one that's your favorite one and you play it, it's going to sound fine, most likely. But when you listen to a dozen and a half of them or so or more, I mean, I, you know, I, I spot check lots of them before I do these talks, you know. And then you compare it in real time. The impression it makes is completely different. That doesn't mean that it's wrong or that it's bad. I was prepared to pull Bohm and say, yeah, the classic Bohm Vienna on DG Originals. But it just struck me in this company as being a little bit on the sluggish side. And I'm sure that I will come back in six months having put all this stuff away and feel none of those reservations because it is a magnificent performance, no question about it. But I, I like to make comparisons, and in making the comparison, that's how it came out. And this one, let me tell you, Monte was a lot like Bruno Walter in the sense that, that he had that, that feeling for the music, that effortless concept of, of flow and forward movement that you're not conscious of, it just happens. He just, he just does it, and you can't really explain how he does it or why it happens the way it does, but you're not conscious of anybody behind this. All you hear is just this fresh, fresh wellspring of music coming at you, and the slow movement, which is about 11 and a half minutes, I think, in this performance, something like that, it has never been better done. Never, never by anybody. It has the most perfectly judged feeling of inevitability that you will ever hear. I mean, it's, it's incredible. It's one of those performances that when you listen to it, you can't imagine the music going any other way. And so I really strongly recommend that you give Monte a good shot because it's fantastic, absolutely fantastic. And those, my friends, are the great performances, and three of the terrible ones, of Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony. Now go listen to a few of them. You owe it to yourself. It's just the most gorgeous piece of music in the universe. I, it blows me away every time I hear it. I mean, it really does. Anyway, keep on listening, folks. Thank you for joining me. Take care.